We're going to read the Word of God from 1 Kings in chapter 17. 1 Kings in chapter 17 and verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And I want you to notice something that has been very much to the fore as I've been reading these verses. Here's a man and he sits at a brook one day where there's no water, but it's an answer to his prayer. That's exactly what Elijah prayed. And that is something that has been coming over to me very much. He's sitting here, and the brook eventually dries up, but it is an answer to his prayer. So be careful what you pray. Be careful what we ask God for, unless we're prepared for the consequences. And verse 2, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, for I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. And we'll end there at verse 7. May God bless his word to our hearts this morning. For those of you that perhaps were not with us last Lord's Day morning and also to refresh our memories, we have commenced a little series on the prophet Elijah the Tishbite, the man that came out of the unknown it would seem. He had a message to deliver to King Ahab and to Jezebel and then he seems to float off the scene again. I said last Lord's Day morning that one of the things that stand out to me mostly from my days in Bible college were the table talks on a Tuesday afternoon given by our matron, the Miss Annie, the late Miss Annie Wilson. And I remember much that she said about Elijah. And Miss Wilson was a woman of God. She used to be the assistant matron in the faith mission. She was the type of person could build you up and take the feet from under you. You wouldn't have pulled the wheel over her eyes whenever you were sent to clean her that. If you had swept anything under a cupboard or that, she would have noticed it. She would have checked you for it. She would have told you how wrong it was to do that. But she was a woman of God. And one day before we finished college, I was painting one of the bedrooms and she put her hand up at her back and she said to me, she says, Brother, I hope this isn't what I think it is. And sadly it was, it was lung cancer and that was to take her life. Eventually, I think I'm right in saying she was 62 years of age. Why does God allow that to happen? There's no answer that I can give you for that. But I want to say, dear friends, that those table talks have stayed on with me and many of the things that she talked about. And one of the things that I want to labor on this morning and over this next week and perhaps maybe two weeks, it is about sitting at the brook. Now, what happened in our story last Lord's Day morning? God has called a hard rugged man to deliver a message to Ahab, king of Israel. This man is an absolute nobody as far as society goes, and God was going to use him to shake the nation of Israel. And last Lord's Day morning we were looking at the historical state of the nation of Israel, and we said this here, that Israel had turned to Baal worship. Baal worship involved the offering and the burning of incense, and also offering burnt sacrifices. Sometimes it was the offering of human sacrifices, but we also covered last week that it was especially, it included lascivious sexual behavior, including sodomy. He marries a woman, a very wicked woman, by the name of Queen Jezebel, 
Uh, she is a promoter of Baal worship. Baal was the god of fertility. Whenever the sun rose high in the sky, the Baal worshippers believed that they were seeing Baal's face. Whenever the great thunder rolled in the sky, his followers believed that they were going to receive the blessings of Baal in the form of rain on the earth. And so this was a very divine challenge to Baal worship whenever Elijah goes right into the palace and he says there's going to be no rain. I've prayed to God. And in James chapter 5 and 17 tells us that he was a man like passion like as we are and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And I don't know what your view of Elijah may be this morning. Perhaps it's what we got in storybooks long ago where we see him sitting at the brook and we see these large birds coming with their food. But I want us to notice today that he was much more than this. And where I concluded last week was not so much where is the God of Elijah, but where are the Elijahs? And if you're not a man or a woman of prayer today, and if I'm not a man of prayer this morning, well then I'm no true follower as such of the kingdom of God. Because one of the very aspects of the new birth is a desire to pray, a desire to read the word of God, and a desire to meet with the people of God. And so it was Jezebel who was promoting this Baal worship among the people of Israel. We noticed last week as to how Elijah dressed. It was symbolic for what he stood for. Here was this man running up and down the streets of Samaria, wearing this girdle of camel's hair. People could have said all sorts of things about him, but he was a man of God. He was a man who could call down fire from heaven. He was a man who was able to see God move. We noticed last week that in his dress code as such, it was symbolic for what he stood for. It spoke of his denouncement and a separation from the world. God's people ought to be a separated people. I spoke about the very fact that he was an ambassador in a sinful world. And so remember, dear friend, he was a man, and in verse 1, he has gone right into the palace, dressed in his camel's hair, and he says of a message from God, a very clear message, there's not going to be even dew nor rain these years, but according to to my word. I would say about Elijah, and with this I'll move on this morning, that spiritual priorities and values controlled his life. I said last Lord's Day morning, we're living in a day whenever the foundations are being removed. I don't know about you, but I stop these days, as you listen to the news, and you see how quickly everybody has become bodies. The North Korea leader, the South Korea leader, Donald Trump, Theresa May, how things are changing very, very rapidly and all this world is calling out for is peace, peace and the world will swallow it, the Bible tells us. But we know that there will be no lasting peace. We can learn in the worst of times that God can raise up faithful men. We also notice in this passage about Elijah that judgment is sure to overtake those who defy God. As soon as he delivers the message, this God-given message, God says to him, Elijah, you're off the scene now. I want you to head to the brook. I was thinking this weekend of Samuel Logan Brangle, who received the call of God and he crosses over the Atlantic. He's going to become a salvationist in the Salvation Army. And whenever he arrived in England, he reckoned that he was going to be starting to preach immediately and all the rest of it. But one of those officers sent him down into a cellar to polish the soldier's boots. And Samuel Logan Brangel said, he says, has God made a mistake? I'm called to preach. Have I crossed the Atlantic? Have I crossed all these miles to come to polish soldier's boots? And God spoke to Brangle through it. And God broke Brangle through it. And I would say to your friends, here's a man here and he's the prophet of God. 
But unless things can work out in a practical way, well then in many ways it's pie in the sky. Let none of us ever get too big for our boots. Too big for God to use. And just as Samuel Brangle learnt it, and maybe you've read some of his books in the past, I'm sure you will have been blessed by them. And so God says to him, Look here, Elijah, you've done your bet. I've called you. I want you to go now to the brook. May I say that in passing this morning that Cherith, it means to cut off. And it also means to cut down. And so just as quickly as God has placed them before men, as quickly God removes him. I'm going to break this uh, passage down into three very simple forms. And this morning I want us to look at the subject, the waiting at the brook. Our matron, our late matron, got the call of God whenever I think she was 14 years of age. She lost her mother whenever she was very young. And she had to become a mother, I think I'm right in saying, to her other six siblings. And many, many years passed. And she told us about those experiences of trying to fulfill her mother's role, where she just had to wait at the brook. And I'll say this here, that waiting at the brook is very, very difficult at times. It's always much easier to run ahead of God. And then I want us, secondly, to notice the provision at the brook. And then thirdly, I want us to notice the drying up of the brook. But Elijah here is very clearly called to go to Cherith, where whenever he gets there, God's plan is to to provide water and provide food. He would drink at the brook, and the ravens would come, and they would deliver the food for him. And then one day the brook's going to dry up, and God's going to say to him, but I'm sending you another place of a poor widow and she's prepared to meet your need at Zarephath and so I'm going to be with you there I'll be with you at the brook and I'll be with you at Zarephath Zarephath was Jezebel's own old territory and God promises Elijah he has arranged for Elijah's needs to be met there at Zarephath also when he arrived at the brook uh, at the widow's house it was where God wanted him to be. I want to ask us a question this morning. Are you where God wants you to be? Now that's a very direct question today. Are you where God wants you to be? And you may say to me, is this literally today? There is a sense, yes, literally. Are you where God wants you to be spiritually today as a father, as a mother, as a child? It's so easy for us to say, oh, I know that I shouldn't be doing this, and I know that I shouldn't have this kind of attitude, and I know this, that, and the other thing. Dear friends, today I'm asking a very direct question to us all, and I'll start with the pulpit. Are we where God wants us to be? If you answer me this morning, you don't have to answer me, but you answer God, and perhaps you say, no, I'm not. I wait to God that as a father, I could open the scriptures and pray with my wee family and encourage them in the ways of God. I wish as a mother, my example would lead them to the place of prayer and the place of sacrifice. And dear friends, maybe you slip through life wishing Wishing, wishing. I'll ask the question again. Are you where God wants you to be? Are you there? You may say to me, where is there? And I want to dwell on this this morning. I want to talk about the there. Because was there is where God promised to meet his need. Oh, I hear people talk sometimes and I respect people's views. And maybe they'll say to me, but things didn't work out this way or that way, and I'm not their judge. I'm not anybody's judge. So I'm not the judge of all the earth, do you write? But sometimes they've never honoured God with their lives. 
And sometimes, maybe, dear friend, the place of prayer has never held much importance. And if you were to ask a family, have you ever prayed with your children? So you may say they're more important over homeworks and all the rest of it. Absolute nonsense. It's more important to teach them the word of God than it is to go over homeworks. And I'm not saying that homeworks should be despised. They're important. But I tell you it's more important to teach the spiritual values that so often are being destroyed even in our own community. And so where is there? I will answer you, dear friend, that there for Elijah it was a brook. That's where God wanted him. There for Elijah for a time was Zarephath. That's where God wanted him. We know that there for Noah it was the ark. That's where God provided him because that's where God wanted him. We know that for Daniel it was a prayer room. That's where God wanted him. And as Daniel goes up and he opens up those lattice windows towards Jerusalem and he bows and he kneels and he prays to God three times a day even though he's defying everybody. That's where God wanted him. And that's where he was going to honor God. Therefore Daniel was the lion's den. Not as a young fellow, but as a man that was getting on in years. That was where God wanted him. And that's where God provided for him. For the three Hebrew children, there was a Hebrew, those Hebrews, it was a fiery furnace. For Ruth, there was a field that was owned by Boaz. For Paul, there was a prison cell. For Jesus, there was the cross. And so I want to ask us again that question. Are you there? Are you there? If you're not there, I want to encourage you to get there. And I want to encourage you to stay there. You know, dear friend, where there ought to be. If God has instructed you and God has given to you a wee family, you have tremendous responsibilities to bring up those children in the ways of God. Oh, the day may come, they may walk away from it, but there for you is your responsibility. You know where you ought to be, maybe whenever it comes to the place of prayer, maybe whenever it comes to a Thursday night, you say to yourself, oh, I know I ought to be in the place of prayer, or maybe it's some prayer union on a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night, and you say, but I know I ought to be there, but I'm too busy, I'm too occupied with other things. I'd encourage you, dear friend, to get there, to stay there. Remember I was at that wake last night, Olive and I, I couldn't help but think of our little brother Gordon Buchanan. And Gordon Buchanan and Mrs. Buchanan, any of you that knew them, you could never fill them with prayer meetings. It wouldn't matter what time in the morning those prayer meetings were. And they had to travel from Ballygally to Mergeshill, which was 13, uh, 13 miles, but they were always there. I never remember the time whenever they weren't. Remember we left to go to Bible College. It was Gordon and Mrs. Buchanan that picked us up and left us to Bible College. And I remember on one occasion whenever maybe our brother, I, there were those that could have been rather critical because I, he wouldn't bail his hay on a Sunday. And rightly so. And I think I'm right in saying that he lost it that year. Because the weather was so poor. But he was out to honour God. We were able to say to our daughter-in-law last night, well, she knows probably better than we do, that our parents-in-law were people who humbly walked with God. You know where there ought to be whenever it comes to prayer, whenever it comes to maybe being an encourager, whenever it comes to being an example. There for you today, dear friend, it may be a factory, it may be a school, it may be a college, it may be the mission field. But God promised him the ravens would feed him there. And I reckon if Elijah had decided, no, I'll go to somewhere else beyond Jordan, he couldn't claim the promises of God. He couldn't. It was where God wanted him to be. He told the widow woman, 
he would feed him there at Zarephath. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. God is not the author of confusion today. He makes his way very, very clear. Moses fled to Midian because of the fury of the Egyptians. Uh, David found shelter from Saul in the cave. John the Baptist from persecution whenever he was cast onto the Isle of Patmos. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Dear friend today, teach your children to honour God. It was Mrs. Bury, the late Mrs. Bury of the Salvation Army, and she said, well, teach your children to tithe. And you'll teach them to be honest. I'm sure there's probably a lot in that. Teach them whenever they get their first pay packet, whether they're delivering newspapers around the door or wherever. Teach them to set aside something for God. You see, Paul said whenever he was converted, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Whenever we're saved, we're no longer our own. We're bought with a price. Price, of course, of the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. Jesus with the apostles on one occasion, the apostles came back and they returned and they were full of themselves and they were all flushed with success. Do what Jesus said to them. Come apart and rest a while. Come apart. F.B. Meyer said, we must not be surprised if our father says, their child, you've had enough of this hurry and publicity and excitement. Go and hide thyself by the brook. You may say to me this morning, spiritually, what is the brook, Cherith? I would say to you, dear friends, it could be the sick chamber. Where God all of a sudden calls you, or calls me, and he says, look here, I want you to just wait at the brook. It could be the sick chamber. It could be bereavement. Bereavement is something that is very, very cruel, and it's very emotional, and everybody's their own ways of working through bereavement. You know, I was visiting someone last week, and you know what they told me? And I thought this was absolutely lovely. I thought it was absolutely lovely. I was so touched by it. They said, you know, I always pray for your church secretary. And I prayed for the one before them. Because mind you, whenever you're going to write a letter about bereavement or that, it's not the easiest letter to write. It's not the easiest. And maybe today you're sitting at the brook, as it were. Maybe it's some sickness. Maybe it's bereavement. Maybe it's discouragement. Maybe today you're sitting at the brook where you're so disappointed. You're disappointed maybe with the way that your, your children are going. Or maybe you're excited and you say to yourself, well, my children are going to just turn out wonderful. We can never go look too far down the road and boast too far. They're in a very cruel world. A very, very cruel world. Maybe today, dear friend, you sit at the brook of depression... I don't know what your brook may be today. But you know the story of Elijah revolves around the God-given commands and those commands was go hide yourself. Hide yourself. And the second one was go show thyself. There was the private aspect of his life and his service. Go and hide yourself. Oh, it's one thing to stand up here this morning and to seek to preach without hiding ourselves. Hiding ourselves in the place of prayer, asking God, well, look, God, what do you want to teach us? What do you want to show us? And I've said the main thing that I have learned in this passage, which I don't think I learned the last time I did the series of Elijah, was that the brook was going to dry up in answer to his prayer. And simply that will tell me again, be careful what we pray for. Be careful. Unless we mean it. Why did God send him to Cherith? Why was it that God called him aside? Why does God call any of us to the brook Cherith in a spiritual sense? First of all, it was to guard him. Whenever the time of reaction was set in, as it almost always does, often after a time of our deal, our special service, there'll be a time of reaction. 
And I can assure you, dear friend, this morning, and there are some of you much better qualified than I am to uh, to uh, relate to these things, that after God blesses you, you can be sure that the devil will do his utmost to steal that blessing. And if God moves in and God saves a member of your family, or God answers some particular prayer, maybe in healing you or doing something for you, you can be sure that the enemy will attack it. He'll not take it lying down. And then the second reason I reckon was to prepare him for further service. At Cherith, he will still learn more about dependence upon God, about complete trust in him. Oh, as you said at the brook this morning, God teaches us something about patience. God will surely teach us something about humility. All of us need to learn these things. You know, surely we're living in a day of spiritual apostasy where I, uh, sadly even in the days of Israel God withdrew himself in days of spiritual apostasy. Think of Amos chapter 8 and verse 11 Behold the days come, saith the Lord God and I will send a famine in the land not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water but I, of the hearing the words of the Lord and they shall wander from sea to sea and from north even to the east they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. And surely there's another generation that is growing up today where the word of God is not being taught. Where there's not those vital examples. Verse 2 tells me, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, I always like to stop at this verse and say to myself, Elijah didn't go to the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came to him. You see, very often whenever we want directions or that, maybe uh, we'll get into the scriptures and we'll search verses and all the rest of it. And you know as well as I do that we can misuse the word of God. Do you remember many years ago, maybe perhaps, maybe you don't, I told a story about a young lad and he said that he was praying for guidance. And so he was asking God as to where to go and he was getting all these different verses as to what to do, but he didn't know what country to go to. And so he's travelling along and he notices that there's an empty peanut bag that is lying on the ground. And he picks it up and he notices it's made in Brazil and so he says to God, I, um, oh, you, you must be calling me to Brazil. And so he went along to his pastor to say to his pastor, look, God must be leading me to Brazil. That's where the country must be. And the pastor, the wise old man, said to him, we better go down and thank God it wasn't a Mars bar was thrown out. <laughs> Sometimes, you see, we can try to gear things for ourselves. The voice of God was unmistakable. How we need to hear uh, God's voice. Elijah was in close communion with God. So much of the world today, so much of the world today, maybe we wouldn't recognize the voice of God. The Bible talks about in the last days, people will have itching ears. Something just to tickle the ear, tickle the fancy. As Elijah walked with the Lord, his plans and his purposes were clearly revealed. How God spoke, we're not told. But one thing we're certain is God speaks through his word. I've already quoted it. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He speaks by a deep peace in our hearts concerning the way forward. Paul writing to the church at Colossae, he said in Colossians 3 and 15, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called, in one body, and be ye thankful. Maybe there's someone here this morning and you find yourself and maybe you're confused with regard to the leadings of God. I'll tell you, dear friend, God's not the author of confusion. And I will tell you, and with this I'm through this morning because time's practically gone and I want to keep my word. And I still go through these channels so often, my own self. How do you know when to, go, when, when to do something? I believe there's some channels that we can slip through. And I'm glad before even I went into the Lord's work, I heard a preacher say about these channels, and I've often thought about them, that there are many times in life whenever I still go through these channels. 
And the first one is this deep inner conviction that this is what I ought to do. The second is confirmation from the Word of God that this is the way walking in it. The third is circumstances being created by God where God opens doors and God closes doors. I remember that preacher say almost 40 years ago now, he says, don't stop there. Make sure the last thing you have is the peace of God that passes all understanding because that's what will keep you. The instructions to Elijah were very clear. They were very precise. They demanded action. Get thee hence, turn thee eastward, hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. He couldn't be confused about it. It was so direct. It was easier to run than to wait. Elijah believed God. And he believed God in the he believed God in childlike faith. And sometimes we're so complicated. We need to go back to childlike faith. Childlike faith is it accepts the word of God without questioning. Childlike faith is such that it flinches not in the presence of the severest demand. This was a demand to Elijah. Elijah, you've done your bit. You're not just going to be the preacher at this stage. You better get behind and you're going to, uh, to the brute and you're going to learn an awful lot first of all before this day comes. Childlike faith, a uh, faith that is not staggered by apparent improbabilities. And it fails not when severely tried. The promise of God's provision. The promise was certain. It shall be. God goes before his people providing for the necessities, the provisions of li- uh, in life. Yours was a very strange catering team that God used. There was no hygiene as such. God was going to use the unclean word. God was going to use the word that actually was condemned in the book of Leviticus. These vultures as such were going to bring the food. Oh, Elijah wasn't going to say, are you wearing special gloves or have you something in your mouth or that? No, he saw the provision It was of God. And so I asked you, dear friend, today, do you know the way forward? Are you there as an individual where God wants you? In the home, in the family, spiritually. If not, I encourage you again, get there. Stay there. And you'll see the provision of God. May God bless these thoughts to our hearts. Our closing hymn is 509, 509, and we'll stand to sing.